you know, they don't talk about nitrogen in the other countries, by the way, <laughs> just Netherlands, you know, with all these fran- uh, they, yeah. they franchise these, uh, these, you know, th- this, th- this attack is happening globally. So the, the World Economic Forum makes a different menu for each country. Here it's a nitrogen, right? But they don't even talk about nitrogen next door in Germany. You know, it's only here. And, 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 and again, why would you take some of the most efficient farmers in the world, if not the most efficient farmers in the world, and knock out their farms and then get somebody else to, to do this, to create less food with more chemicals? See, it doesn't make any sense. It's just nonsense. Do you think it's reasonable to put such a large exporter of meat under the same emission laws as other con- like countries in Europe? That, well, yeah, that's what some of the farmers and some of the meat industry are arguing, mm-hmm. saying we have to follow the same strict regulations, but we produce so much more and we have so much less space. Is it really fair? Well, we should have argued that 30 years ago when we were making the rules. Like we made this agreement and we haven't kept our word to our other European partners for 30 years. So now if we go back to Brussels and argue for leniency, then the European Commission will say no. Like we haven't, we haven't forced you to take action, but we're also not going to make the rules uh, le- looser now. Welcome to episode 156 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. This is an episode of Opposing Views where I speak with individuals on opposite sides of a contentious issue. This episode discussed the Dutch farming crisis and the origins behind it. This is a topic everyone should be paying attention to. It isn't an isolated incident. I interviewed Nick Ottens, a Dutch political writer for the Atlantic Sentinel, and Michael Jan, a journalist and America's most experienced combat correspondent. We discussed two completely different views about what started the Dutch farmers' protests, what the Dutch farmers are trying to achieve, the global context of the crisis, the local effects of the Netherlands, the efficiency of Dutch farming, and more. Thanks for watching, and enjoy this episode. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gold Co., a leader in the precious metals industry. Inflation is at its highest since 1980. We're currently in a recession, although that's not what the U.S. government would tell you. In July of 2022, Bloomberg reported that the inflation of average consumer goods has reached 9.1% in the U.S. from the previous year at the same time. Along with that, the stock market is volatile and the rate that the government is spending and printing money is out of control and has been for a while. These three variables play a crucial role in determining the value of your retirement savings. This is where Gold Co. does the most for you. Gold Co. has helped thousands of Americans protect over $1 billion in retirement savings. As inflation continues to increase in the wake of a global pandemic, consider the fact that gold and silver have historically been a hedge against inflation. Translating your money into gold and silver is a safe way to legally safeguard your retirement savings in a way that's tax and penalty free. Dad has money in gold. I have money in gold. It's a good idea. Gold Co. has an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating, and they're currently offering a promotion that gives qualifying new customers $10,000 or more in free silver. Even if the health of the economy is questionable, you can still protect your savings with physical gold and silver. Call my friends at Gold Co. today to see how you can get paid to protect your retirement. Visit mplikesgold.com and they'll give you up to $10,000 in free silver when you open a qualifying account. That's mplikesgold.com. Tell them that I sent you. Michael Yon, welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me on. I'm in The Hague, uh, Netherlands. The, you know, Netherlands has basically two capitals, Amsterdam and The Hague. And tomorrow I'll be in the other capital. But, you, know, you might say the real capital. I don't know what the Dutch will say about that. But I'll be back in Amsterdam for a big protest. Wow. Okay. So uh, before we get started, can you give me a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Yes. Uh, I'm Michael Jan. I'm from Winter Haven, Florida originally, but I've lived overseas most of my life. Uh, all over the world. I have an office in Thailand. Uh, I've lived and worked in more than 80 countries. And, um, and as you can see, I'm here now. I was in Mexico a couple of weeks ago tracking the migration, uh, which is huge. Uh, and before that, I was in uh, Texas and Panama and Colombia and Morocco, Greece, Lithuania, tracking migration issues and food and energy as well. Because all of these things are, I'm a war correspondent, and all of these things are important to 
war, right? Because war is all about conditions. Not that I always do just war, that would be untrue, but, but I do uh, watch where conflict is and the things that can bring, um, you know, things that we need to pay attention to. Like right now we see Panama melting down, which is something I've been warning about for some time now. And then Panama, although it's not much on the news right now, I believe, but you know, we've got the Panama Canal there, which obviously is wildly important. Uh, and also Panama is an invasion corridor to the United States. And there's huge numbers of people coming from about 150 countries through uh, Asia and Africa and South America. And they come through Colombia and then they head through that jungle called the Darien Gap. It's a gap of jungle there between Colombia and Panama. I've spent months down there in the last year or so. Uh, and from there, they just head north and end up all over the United States and Canada. So it's massive. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's uh, roughly 10,000 uh, migrants. This is, number will change within hours. I mean, there's massive numbers coming in right now due to various reasons, and uh, and they're heading north. And uh, in May of this year, there was 310,000 just in May uh, illegal uh, alien entries that were known into the United States. 310,000 in one month that were known, but that number is skyrocketing. So these are the things I watch. I watch food. I've been warning about potential famine now since January of uh, 2020. I've warned about it every day for 30 months now, and now it's coming to pass. And so that's why I'm in Europe right now. That's why I'm in the Netherlands, because the farmers are revolting here. Uh, they're not revolting as in disgusting. <laughs> they are revolting against the World Economic Forum. And so uh, they, they are, and that's why I left Mexico and came straight here. Uh, the German uh, farmers have joined, Polish farmers, huh. and you may have seen the Italians and Spanish as well, not to mention Americans. I mean, this is a big, big deal. Okay, so this this isn't just farmers in the, the Netherlands. <clears throat> no, this is huge. Uh, you know, and I'm a global player. I don't, you know, I don't watch just Texas or California or Thailand or China. I spend a lot of time in all of these places. Well, I don't think I can go back to China. They kicked me out of Hong Kong in 2020 with much prejudice. And actually, if they were smart, they would have kicked me out earlier. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but it, I spend a lot of time in Asia and, and, and just all over the world, actually. And so I'm, I'm constantly because everything must be taken into context. Right. And there's there's no truth in the world without context. Like, for instance, right now, many people are starting to watch Panama in the last few days uh, and they're trying to judge which way Panama is going to go. And having done this for so many years around the world, I can pretty much make a good estimate of which way it's going to go. I'm watching the context. I'm watching the conditions. It's not about sparks. Amateurs always talk about sparks, like what will be the spark that sets off the fire? It's not about that. It's about conditions. When the conditions are right, there's always sparks. If you, you, you can have a firework factory blow up in a rainforest, but it's rainy and it's a rainforest and it's not going to catch the forest on fire. But, you know, in a dry forest, somebody throws out a cigarette and boom, you know, a town mm -hmm. burns down. And, and so it's about conditions. Right now in Panama, the global conditions clearly are deteriorating with energy supplies, food supplies, uh, transportation, many other things. And so Panama sits within Panama is a small boat, you might say, in a big sea. And uh, in the sea that it's in is getting choppier and choppier. And, uh, and the Panama Canal is very important to us, obviously. It runs right through Panama. And so this is a big deal. That's why I've been watching uh, Panama so closely, that and some other reasons. And, and you see, so watching the conditions, my estimate is that Panama will go in a bad direction, which is very serious for us. And so, and that's why I'm here in Netherlands. Netherlands is arguably the number two food exporter in the world. Uh, if this were a small food exporter somewhere, uh, I wouldn't probably have come because there's other items on the table that demand attention as well. And so I'm constantly reprioritizing and, and trying to go to the things that are that I sense are the most important. And uh, so that's why I've been watching food and energy and migration patterns uh, very intensely since uh, since January of 2020 when the pandemic started. Uh, in fact, I was one of the first, by the way, calling out the pandemic. I was in January. Uh, I was I was loud hmm. and clear about it. And re remember, back in January, February, March of 2020, when you called it a pandemic, you would be knocked off of social media. Yeah. And uh, 
And so, so I was out there saying, mm, I think it might be a pandemic. You know, I'm not sure, but that's the way it looks. And anyway, we see how history has unfolded since then. It's been quite interesting. Uh, and so that's where we're going right now. You can see that we're going, we're going into global famines. And, uh, and that's why I'm here in this huge food exporter. And it's only 17 million people in this country. I mean, Netherlands is a tiny country that they've reclaimed much of it from the sea. This is an amazing country. I mean, uh, uh, geographically, they've created much of the country. I mean, these are extraordinary people. Um, And they, you know, this is, I I call it like flat pyramids. You can't, I mean, the the amount of technology and work that they put into building this country is so extraordinary. And you you just can't uh, imagine. I mean, uh, you know, these old windmills are so sophisticated. that, that have been, you know, out working for uh, centuries to, to, uh, uh, you know, pump the water out of the, uh, the, the places that they reclaim and, uh, and finally to plant and make this, uh, this land so fertile. These are the most efficient farmers in the world, arguably. And so we've got the WEF, go ahead. You wanted to say something? Go ahead. Oh, well, you said most efficient. They're already the most efficient farmers in the world. They're extremely efficient. And arguably the most efficient, of course, you might get farmers fighting about that, but so we'll uh, just let that lay, but, but yeah, probably the most efficient in the world. And uh, certainly let's just say extremely efficient. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, so they can get a lot done with a little bit. And much of this is land that they reclaim from the sea anyway. Right. And so now with the world economic forum is specifically targeting Netherlands, the, the Dutch farmers, and trying to take their land away, and they're succeeding with some of it right now, and they're saying they're using the excuse of you know nitrogen and ammonia and all these sorts of things, but in fact, in fact, that's chaff, that's decoy, right? It has nothing to do with nitrogen. In fact, they don't say anything about nitrogen to the German farmers right over the border, which is just close by. They don't say anything to the Polish about nitrogen. It's just Netherlands because they, with the, the World Economic Forum, they tailor make. It's like a I travel around the world watching the things that they do and CCP, you know, Chinese Communist Party. I, I watch a lot of things, but uh, in some of these fights you see are franchised, right? It's almost like a, a fast food franchise with a different menu in every country. They study, you know, how will our, our, uh, how can we achieve our goals in this country? Well, here we should, you know, according to this culture, we should do this. We'll have a different menu here, right? So in Netherlands, they go after nitrogen. Right. Which is just ridiculous. But why would you not? Why would you knock out the most efficient or arguably the most efficient farmers in the world and take them off of their farms so that you can get who to do it? India. You know, I mean, farmers, I spent about a year in India. I mean, that's they're not exactly as efficient as the Dutch, to put it mildly. And so uh, and so so, but there's much more at play here. For instance, the World Economic Forum, clearly Bill Gates is buying up farmland everywhere. Uh, and, and, and he has he's uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has invested six hundred million dollars in the, the picnic food distribution centers, one of which burned down here about two weeks ago. I went to see it hours after they put it out. And, uh, and it's a, it, it's these food distribution centers that you, you order online with an app and you don't go to the store. And then they just the, the, the electric vehicles deliver this food to your home. So it sort of knocks out the grocery store. So basically with their cricket farms and these sorts of things, people like Bill Gates are working to take complete control over food supply from production to distribution. So that's just bottom up, right? So cricket factory to table, right? And, but they got to take out these farmers. And another part of this, taking out the farmers that are the most efficient, uh, whether that's the United States or here or Germany, um, they're working on something called tri-state city which almost no Americans have ever heard about. Tri-state city. Tri- mm-hmm. Many Dutch haven't heard of it. Tri-state city is they, the, 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 the World Economic Forum are working to take this land for another goal. Tri-state city is this mega city that's planned between the tri-states of Belgium, Germany, and Netherlands in that bo- tri-state border area. Yeah. It'll be a mega smart city. These smart cities are you know, basically making us the farm animals. So they want to take out these farmers, the Frisian farmers, and, and take their land and make this tri-state city. And then they'll have control of that food supply, right? And another problem with farmers is they have common sense and they think for themselves, right? 
So this has been a constant problem for authoritarians. Farmers have always been a needle in the, in the side for authoritarians. For instance, in Ukraine, for Stalin, he wanted to knock out the farmers. Which he, so they labeled them kulaks, the, 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 uh, the Ukrainian farmers. And, uh, and so basically kulak became a very bad word. Nobody wanted to be called a kulak. And so they they uh, labeled them and and, uh, and started attacking and, and did the uh, the Holodomor famine between especially 1932 and 33 and, and killed billions right and took their land and replaced the farmers with other farmers who were not as good by the way which created more famine right and so and Mao did the same thing so this is a common thing with farmers farmers they have their own cultures. They have their own ways. They don't do what the boss wants them to do. The boss being whoever the authoritarian of the day is. And so these authoritarians always want to go for the farmers. Another important aspect of the Dutch farmers is they are one of the backbones of the culture of this country. Right. And so you'll see the, uh, the Mark Rutte is the uh, is the prime minister of Netherlands. Right. Mark Rutte. And you can see Klaus Schwab, the the let's say the mafia boss of the World Economic Forum, specifically um, praising Mark Rutte in front of a crowd of his, you know, dark cult, let's call it. And, you know, he's like, where can you get such a prime minister or something like that? You can see the video, you know, it must've been making Trudeau quite jealous actually, you know, cause he and Trudeau or Mark Rutte and Trudeau are a couple of his boys. Right. And Mark Rutte is like, yes, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, Mark Rutte is just a boy of the world economic forum as is Trudeau and as are many others. Right. And so they, if they can take out these farmers, they'll do multiple things at once, gain more control over the global food supply, gain, that means production and distribution, and, and, uh, and also break the backbone of the cultural, back, the cultural backbone, the psychological backbone of the Netherlands, so they're of the Dutch people. And so they're, the, the WEF has been pushing this massive migration into Europe, as you know, and North America, and this, of course, is you go out to some of these small villages and you look around and it's mostly people from Middle East and Africa. And this is Dutch villages. Who, what are they going to do? Take over the farms? Stalin did this back in, in Ukraine, right? Replaced the farmers, the Kulak farmers with Russians. And the Russians were just unable to farm. And not just Russians, but it was often people from the cities who really didn't know it. I guess, you know, it, it appears there's a great book on this called Red Famine. You know, it, it appears that those authoritarians just thought anybody can run a farm. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Not it's like, easy. It's not like anybody. Yes, yeah, like here's a spaceship. Anybody can fly a spaceship. They don't realize that's a lot of knowledge. It's not just knowledge. It's also, it's a way of life. It's hard work. It's seven days a week. So when I was down in Mexico a couple of weeks ago, and I saw Dutch farmers, um, you know, starting to protest, well, they've been doing it for two and a half years. And uh, or at least two and a half years. Um, oh, so it, it hasn't started. just it hasn't just been a month long thing. This has been happening for years. It's 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 picking up now. It's picking up. So when I so when I see farmers in all the countries I go to as a war correspondent, I instantly look for farmers. I look for truckers. I look. For, I talk with law enforcement, military. What do you think about the military? What do you think about the police, government? But you really want to talk with farmers. When you see farmers starting to, or the truckers in Canada, when you see them starting to take to the streets, these are people that don't want to waste a lot of energy. They're not baristas or something. You know what I mean? They're not just going to get upset. These farmers, they work seven days a week. You know, at the end of the day, they go to bed. You know what I mean? <laughs> they And they wake up early and they go right back to work. So when you see a bunch of farmers out on the street, you need to stop and go and say, what's the problem? Why are there a thousand tractors on the road? Uh, because I know something's wrong. If a thousand, every, every country I go to, I can get along with the farmers. I don't care where to, when I was in Afghanistan for two years, I was out with farmers all the time, Iraq too. I can get along with them. And, and uh, where, Thailand, Nepal, India, China, it doesn't matter. They all have common sense, you know what I mean? And they all don't like to waste energy. So when the farmers are upset, you need to stop and ask them. So these farmers, unlike many farmers in the world, like down in Panama, where I've been spending a lot of time recently, uh, the farmers there are more like, you know, they just, they have simpler needs. They just want cheap gas, you know, just fix the cheap, the gas thing. Just, you know, fix a little, little things. If you tweak this, I'll be happy. 
But these farmers here in Netherlands are more sophisticated. They realize that this is a big game. Like they are all highly cognizant of uh, uh, the World Economic Forum and Schwab and all these relationships, you know, with the picnic uh, food distributions and the cricket fact. They're, you know, they don't, most of them don't even want to talk about nitrogen because they know it's nonsense, right? They know it's just chaff. It's just a decoy. And, and it's all about taking their land, knocking them off the land, taking control of the food uh, production and distribution and complete control, authoritarian control. Now, look at Ukraine. If you were to design a war, last year I was in Lithuania tracking migration from Belarus over to uh, into Ukraine, right? Lukashenko, the, the dictator, was pushing, and he still is, even yesterday, pushing migrants to, to uh, Lithuania. So I flew from Africa up to Lithuania last year to ask, what's up with these migrants, <laughs> Belarus pushing migrants, trying to push them into Poland and trying to push them into Lithuania. Uh, something's up. I mean, to me, that's a signal, right? That's not noise. Yeah. Uh, and and Pol Poland wasn't letting them in. I, uh, Poland's not like that. Pol I lived in Poland two years. Poland is just not going to, to roll over. That's not how Poland rolls, right? And Lithuania is hardcore too, actually. They're pretty serious people. And uh, the, so the Lithuanians, so I, I, I said, hey, I'm down in Morocco, what's going on? And they're like, fly up here, we'll give you complete access. So I flew up to Lithuania, got complete access for three weeks, a month, intelligence, elected officials, army, police, border patrol, access to the camps where they were holding the migrants. And I started warning about Russia doing something, either to the Baltic states or perhaps to Ukraine. You see now it's Ukraine. But if you're, what I'm getting to with all this is none of this just started, right? It, it, it's all been building. And, and not only that, this whole region is always, I call it the Middle East for white people. You know, I lived in Europe for six years, right? I mean, this is a fractious area. We always look at the Middle East as this complex area where everybody always fights each other. Well, that's Europe too, actually. It's just that since World War II, we've had the U.S. Army and the U.S. military stationed over here very thickly. And I was, I used to be a soldier actually stationed in Germany. So, I mean, we, we, kept, we kept the place, you know, mostly peaceful actually for the most part and so it was very prosperous that those days are coming to an end and and the old freshness is acting up again so bottom line is if you were to to design a war to create global or to exacerbate the conditions that will lead to global famine that would be ukraine russia right another good target why if evil would be oh of oh, the energy uh, the, or, uh, for instance, uh, Nord Stream, uh, the gas supplies that are coming from uh, Russia to Europe. Luckily, Russia just turned on Nord Stream again in the last, I don't know, 18 hours or so. That's probably about mm. right. Uh, you know, they, the, uh, Europe, Germany in particular is so dependent upon Russia for energy. It's unbelievable. So you got Germany over here going, yay, let's help, you know, Ukraine go to war. I'm like, hey, you know. Russia has you by the throat. You know what I mean? Wow. If you don't know what your throat, if you don't know how important your throat is, Putin sure does. So Putin shut off Nord Stream a few days, about what, five days ago for annual maintenance. And, you know, everybody's starting to worry about that. Now keep in mind, uh, the, the, the liquid natural gas that they need to run many of those factories and whatnot is also needed for the Haber-Bosch process, which is used to make ammonium nitrate fer uh, fertilizer, which is vital and important, right? Now, they can make up a lot of that natural gas from the United States, much of which ships out of Texas. However, roughly one month ago, maybe three weeks, we had an explosion, which you can find on the news, yeah. at a Texas port. So that explosion at, the, that, uh, at that uh, port, uh, at the LNG facility, curtailed our natural gas uh, exports to Europe. And then we had an explosion wow. in the field on the pipeline in Texas. So that's two. And then we had an accident at, or whatever happened in Oklahoma at an LNG facility. Bang, bang, bang. Three right in a row in the last about three weeks. While, <laughs> you know, Russia's got, uh, just uh, is throttling Europe. And meanwhile, you've got people like Zelensky telling Canada, don't send that turbine. There's a turbine that you have up in Canada to refer that needs to be refurbished to for just maintenance, right? And, and, but it, that turbine is needed to make the Nord Stream uh, pipe, Nord Stream One pipeline work, right? And uh, and Zelensky over in Ukraine is saying, "Don't send it back." And he's, you know, he's he's hitting on Canada like you can't send it back. And Germany, you shouldn't. He's basically Zelensky 
you know, the T-shirt man over in Ukraine uh, is telling Germany just freeze to death this winter because you know we need we need we need to uh, to uh, cut off Russia's uh, you know money uh, pipeline. It's not going to cut off Russia's uh, uh, hard currency. They're they're selling to the. Or hard currency is going to have a new meaning here soon. But they're selling also now, op- they're opening more uh, sales routes through Saudi Arabia, through uh, China, through uh, India. I mean, it's not Russia. When you're dealing with Russians, they're very smart. You know, they're, you, you can't just walk in and, and beat up the Russians. You know, <laughs> they, they're thinking people, they play chess in many dimensions. Yeah. And, and, you know, these people that predicted that this Ukraine war would be over very quickly. I'm like, hold on, Rambo. That's not how this goes. You either haven't been in a lot of wars or, or, or you're trying to sell something because that's not how this works. And those are Russians. They're not little chumps. You're not going to just come push them around. They've got all kinds of buttons and valves that they can, you know, manipulate and they're doing it. Wow, you really have I'm an sorry, eye you on this. To say something, from, I think. No, no, you you just have an eye on this from a, uh, a world level. It's very interesting. It's very. Uh, interesting. I, I'm constantly walking the line. So, whether it's you know Afghanistan or Iraq or Sri Lanka, you know, last time I was in Sri Lanka, which was what I don't know, five years ago or so, uh, maybe maybe five. There was plenty of food. There was you know yeah. Sri Lanka is a land of plenty, right? And yet the WEF, World Economic Forum, same ones that are hitting us here in Netherlands. I say us because the farmers, whenever I see farmers uprising, I stop like, what's going on here? Should I get on an airplane and go talk with these farmers? And uh, so they, you know, the World Economic Forum somehow persuaded, probably through, you know, uh, payoffs. I don't know how they did it specifically. It doesn't matter. The mechanisms are not specifically important, but they got the government of Sri Lanka to the WF got the government of Sri Lanka to go organic, which is now leading to while well, the government, while well, Sri Lanka is now, you know, a failed state. And it got, it went from a stable country almost instantly to a failed state. Think about that. And one of the things that's interesting about famine, let's talk about pan for war, pandemic, famine, war, and migration, pandemic, famine, war. This is a triangle of death. These three things always go together. Pandemic, famine, war. If you get a big one, pandemic, you're going to get famine and war. If you get big famine, you'll get the other two. And if you get a big war, you'll get the other two, right? If you get three musketeers, you get one, you get them all, right? I'm not talking about a small, you know, go invade Grenada and have a shootout for a week. I'm talking about a really serious war. You're always going to have famine and pandemic, right? And... uh, and, and then that creates this human osmotic pressure, the push and pull of migration. There's many things that create the human osmotic pressure, the hop. Uh, it can be just economics. There's the positive pressure, which is like a fire, you know, like a war, a pandemic, um, uh, um, famine, that positive pressure that pushes you out. Like, we got to get out of here, you know, a war, you know, fire, let's run from the fire. Uh, and then there's the negative pressure that pulls you in, like, let's go to Canada, because that's a nice place, right? So you've got the vacuum or the thing that sucks you in, right? And so uh, so there's the positive and the negative pressure, right? And so so anytime you get the triangle of death, it gets ramped up here. And that's why in January of 2020, I started warning about famine because this is all I do is study war and conflict and migration and famine. And pa- by the when this pandemic kicked off, I had already read 40 books, four zero books on pandemic before it started. And then during lockdown, I read 20 more, right? And so likewise, I study famine just as hard and so you know i'm watching these things and and now people are starting to ask why were you so far ahead on the famine i'm like because i know when you get one you get the other two that's just how it goes and it's funny i I was talking about this one time on an interview maybe a year ago and a lady said you talk about this like you discovered it yourself and i'm like well i kind of did and she goes no it's in the bible i was like wait a minute it is in the bible they so (laughs) so they knew about it two thousand years ago you know what i mean they, and so, I mean, and so I started looking back and I looked up many of these uh, scriptures in the Bible. I'm like, they were clearly describing pandemic famine for horsemen. I mean, you know, it's crystal clear. But me studying war, reading hundreds of books on war, spending years in wars, studying pandemic, seeing food shortages. You know, I'm just watching it on the ground and reading about it in books and realizing 
wow, if you get one, you're definitely getting the other two. It's like if you, so famine also creates famine. When you get famine, it creates more famine. Like fire creates fire, war creates war, famine creates famine. Why does famine create famine? It, famine creates famine uh, through various mechanisms. One is once you go into a, the initial food shortages and people are hungry, they're going to they're going to start stealing stuff because they're hungry. They're not criminals. They're hungry people, right? They're going to do what life tells them to do, which is eat. So they start robbing the stores, which is happening in Panama right now, as we speak. I'm getting almost hourly updates from Panama. They're robbing stores, robbing the trucks, robbing the trains. So those things will stop flowing, right? So that makes it worse, right? So then people start to rob the farms. And also the governments always do price controls when you get into famine every time. And the government just started price controls in Egypt and also um, Panama and other places, right? What does that and so mean? the price controls, are, price controls, for instance, um, controlling the price of gas. Like, you know, we have to stop the gas at 325 a gallon in Panama. Okay. They, they just um, made an agreement to make it 325. I think they signed that agreement and immediately that didn't work and they started fighting again. But the bottom line is that won't hold because they, you know, they set the price of, at such a uh, level that the the, the the station you know the the business people can't afford to do it right so you'll get the gas that went through and as long as they can keep the subsidies going but then you know you can okay the price of gas is 325 but you can't get the gas right you can't get the diesel so yeah you got a low price but you, if you can get it and you can't right so this in turn it's a complex system that starts to break down right in other words the tractors don't work in other words, you don't get the fertilizer that you need. So famine creates famine through various mechanisms. One is the price controls are counterproductive. They stop farmers from growing because the farmers can't make money, right? And another thing is the government start taking from the farmers direct, like they're doing in Egypt right now, forcing the farmers to sell to only approved uh, uh, warehouses, that sort of thing. That's what Mao did. That's what Stalin did. That's what they always do, without exception again, because the government's like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. We need to do price controls. We need to start taking control of the food supply, right? And so they start going home to home and house to house and redistributing food. That's only Band-Aids. And then, and then people start robbing directly from the farmers. That's why when you saw these huge migrations into Europe in about 2016 or so, I kept warning. I lived in Europe for six years. I started warning, uh, you know, the, uh, you, you don't understand what's going to happen. I spend so much time in their countries. Uh, they will start robbing directly from the farmers. And uh, at first, it'll just be a pain. But the moment that you have something serious going on, uh, the farmers will stop growing. So this is, a, a, again, so the food, that initial famine that you tend to get will, will exacerbate and, and explode, right? It will, it will increase because the farmers will stop planting. They'll stop uh, doing their farm work, right? And so then you end up with, that second season of the famine is worse. Now, as the months unfold and the food supplies dwindle and the nutritional health of, let's say, 10 million or 20 million or 100 million people, you know, you've got a whole society now that's malnourished, their immune systems are weakened. And you can see where this is going. Mm. Imagine tens of millions of people or hundreds of millions of people with weakened immune systems, pandemic, right? And so you'll get something called famine fevers, in all the big famines, you always get famine fevers. One of the famine fevers is typhus. Another one is relapsing fevers, and then there's others. And then you get waterborne illnesses like um, cholera. Um, and these things, you know, often in famine, more people actually die from, from the diseases than the actual famines, uh, but because it's all part of the same system, right? They're not, they're not really separable. So they, they feed into each other. And the weaker you get, the less able you are to defend yourself. But when I say defend yourself, that might mean just growing crops, right? So, you know, and it just gets worse and it melts down for some period of time. So that's what we're looking at now. We're on that front. There's different types of famines as well. There's like, I call them light switch famine. The one that's kind of sudden, it can kind of start and, and, then it, can, and it can end quickly or slowly. But for instance, in here in Netherlands in 1944, 45, they had something called the hunger winter, the hunger winter. Uh, that was when the Nazis came in and, and destroyed a lot of the food uh, production and distribution facilities, seized a lot of their food because the, the, the Dutch were resisting and the, and the Nazis wanted to knock them in the head. So they did so with their food. And so that famine was very sudden. It started very quickly 
and then Americans and others came through with uh, Market Garden and other operations and, and swept the Germans out of uh, uh, Netherlands and the famine was over very quickly. Roughly six months or so, the famine was, was over, right? But many other famines, they start very slowly and they gradually pick up. And most famines don't last for more than a couple of years, uh, but there are others that last seven, 10 years, even longer, right? These are those slower, gradual famines. You kind of gradually fade into it, and then you reach some, you know, if you'll have wars in the, in the interim and lots of disease, and then you'll slowly leave it, right? So we're in that circle of life. Uh, you know, it's not like, not like that we're going through something that's never been done before. I mean, this is, this is it. Yeah. Our ancestors have all been through this stuff, and we're about to see it ourselves. Uh, so uh, I, I spoke to somebody from the Netherlands, a journalist reporting there, and his view was that the Netherlands has been producing too much nitrogen, that they've been producing too much nitrogen for the last 30 years, and that it was kind of a law passed from the European Union into the Netherlands, and that they need to do this because they're destroying insect species and it's affecting birds in the Netherlands because of all the pollution that has to do with livestock. What do you think about that story? Uh, the journalist is a shill. Uh, you know, it's, it's clear, clearly a shill. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, it's BS. But let's just say it flatly, it's bullshit. Uh, you know, the, um, it's just, you know, they don't talk about nitrogen in the other countries, by the way, <laughs> just Netherlands. You know, with all these, fran uh, they, yeah. they franchise these, uh, these, you know, this this attack is happening globally. So the the World Economic Forum makes a different menu for each country. Here it's a nitrogen, right? But they don't even talk about nitrogen next door in Germany. You know, it's only here. And 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 again, why would you take some of the most efficient farmers in the world, if not the most efficient farmers in the world, and knock out their farms, and then get somebody else to to do this to create less food with more chemicals? See, it doesn't make any sense. It's just nonsense. And, you know, and, and but go ahead. Uh, I think their view was, well, each country has a limit, the amount of nitrogen they can produce. And because the Netherlands produces so much food and they're small, they produce over the limit. And so this is these are laws that were made in the 90s. And because they're producing over the limit, they just have to produce less. They're actually not laws. It's bureaucratic nonsense that comes from Brussels. Right. And so basically we've got bureaucrats like the EPA in the United States, the, 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 uh, the, you know, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, which by the way, let me clarify something. As somebody who travels the world extensively, like China, sometimes when I'm, well, they're probably not gonna let me back in China again. But when, when you're landing in Beijing or Shanghai or other, especially Beijing, I mean, there's so much pollution down there. It looks like your airplane's going to get stuck in it before it lands, like wow. they're going to get stuck in the amber. It's really bad. And it's likewise in India. So when you're in countries like this and you see how terrible those rivers are, you're like, okay, I'll take some EPA. You know, we yeah. need some EPA. You know, but, you know, I understand it. I want it. But then these, these organizations, these uh, like the EPA and the CDC in the United States and others, they become abusive. They become tools for authoritarians to make to bureaucratically make quote unquote laws uh these bureaucrats who how are they even did they even get into their positions in brussels right how, nobody even knows who they are right so they come up with these 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 uh edicts these mandates you might say they're just rules they're not laws and they say well you know we're the eu and we're we tell everybody in the EU what to do. And therefore the Dutch farmers can't produce so much nitrogen. You know, these are probably yeah. people that never took a chemistry class in their life. 78% of that, the air that we breathe, 78% of that's nitrogen. Every breath we take right now is 78% nitrogen, right? The whole fertilizer, the plants can't grow without nitrogen. The whole world, our lives revolve around nitrogen, right? So, I mean, it, it, it's just nonsense. But so when you're chasing that nonsense, though, and, and you start talking about it, they're winning. They're absolutely winning. As somebody who studies information, war, remember the kinetic wars, you know, the gun fights and all that stuff, which I did years of that and various wars and conflicts, uh, very tuned into that kinetic side. That's the high school level of war. PhD level war is information war, right? It's all between the ears. 
It's, and, and I've written three books on information war. I've actually written six books, but three wow. were just on information war. Unfortunately, they're only in Japanese because I've been focused uh, for uh, uh, some time trying to wake up the Japanese about the information wars that they are, are there, that, that they are undergoing, right? And so, when, and I see what they're doing in Japan. I see what they're doing in China. You know, I see what they're doing in, in Philippines and Thailand, trying to split Thailand in three parts. They're doing the same in Malaysia, trying to get Indonesians and Malaysians to fight each other, like with musical, uh, you know, appropriation. Like, you know, look at look at the fights between Indonesia and Malaysia about uh, who who started the music. You know what I mean? They get people to fight about this little nonsense stuff. You know, and the next thing you know, it's like, you know, people beating each other up in the streets about it. Uh, or who can wear a kimono? You know, Japanese don't like people wearing kimono dresses, which is nonsense. Japanese are, I deal with Japanese constantly, literally seven days a week, right? I've written three books that are only in Japanese. So I'm, I wrote them in English, but they were published only in Japan, trying to wake up the Japanese information war. What I'm getting to is information war is my backyard, right? Uh, and my front yard, you know? So I, you know, and, uh, and so when I look at the nitrogen thing, I just see it for what it is, that chaff. Like recently I was off in Morocco with a war correspondent friend of mine named Chuck Holton. And, and there's this new language on the road signs. And I was like, Chuck, what language is this? That's not Arabic. It's <laughs> certainly not English. And, uh, and it's no, in fact, it's no language that I've ever seen before. And, and he's like, I don't know. And I, and I said, it looked like some strange language. I said, you know what? I'll bet that's some information campaign. And so get back to the hotel and look up, you know, strange language, road signs, Morocco. Well, it's this new um, written language for a Berber class of languages. Berber is not a language. It's a class of languages, right? And they don't, it's a, they don't have a written language for Berber. So they've come up with this new written language for Berber. And now there was some controversy in the be beginning. If you're going to have a new written language for Berber, it should be in like modified Arabic. So they all, they, they already know the Arabic alphabet. Everybody knows how to pronounce the letters and that sort of thing. But no, they just made up a new one. You should look up this Berber alphabet. It looks like Furbies talking to each other. It's like computers talking to each other, these strange symbols. But this is how you get people to fight each other, right? We get everybody to start fighting over little things about, you know, get the French speakers to fight the English speakers. Some of that will be organic. So when you're trying to get people to fight each other. You find little frictions that they already have and you pour the salt on. Or you just come in and make stuff up, right? Like, hey, that nitrogen's really poisonous. It's killing the insects or whatever, you know? And, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's killing these bugs. So let's take the most efficient or arguably the most efficient farmers in the world and get somebody else to do it, right? And uh, it, to make the food. Uh, it doesn't make sense. So, it, but it, for me, since this is what I do seven days a week, it's really obvious. So I don't, I don't, I won't even argue yeah. about the nitrogen thing because I, I deal with this in so many countries, right? But, but in every country, it'll be something else. It'll always be something else. Oh, you grow a different type of potato than we do or something, you know, and they'll start fighting about, Hey, we invented that potato. And, you know, it's like, so you won't what's believe the, how, many, how many things you'll see. What's the reason behind getting people to fight? What's the end goal here? Oh, divide and conquer. Uh, for instance, there's an information campaign now against the farmers in Netherlands. So, for instance, yesterday when I did uh, interviews, um, actually with your father, right, which is incredible interviews. And uh, while we were waiting, I'm talking naturally. I'm interviewing everybody around me. You know what I mean? So there's the a lot of camera and audio and the makeup ladies doing my makeup. You know, and I, and I had makeup on. And so, <laughs> and so. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I asked her about the farmers and all that. She says, oh, yes, you know, they say bad things about the farmers on the news. You know, they're blocking the streets and stuff. So there's some kind of anger building up from some people against the farmers. And I said, oh, that's interesting, because that's what they do everywhere. So the farmers rise up, and that's your backbone. That's the people you should be defending, right? Like if the farmers are rising up, I'm just going to be like, ah, I need to drive out and talk with farmers, you know, and, and instead they're like, hey, the farmers are bad guys. That's what Stalin did in, in labeling the oh. farmers. Cool. Hey, but that's why your food prices are high, because the farmers are making so much money. That's why, you know, this, that's why that the farmers are the problem. So you do an information war against the Ooh. farmers and then, you know, and, and then and then you cause many problems for the farmers and then the farmers start to act up. 
or the truckers in Canada, and then you start to demonize the truckers or the farmers, right? And by the way, the truckers in Canada were very inspirational for truckers in the United States. I drove all the way across the United States with truckers from California to Washington, D.C., because they took the lead from the truckers in Canada. They were flying Canadian flags all across America. I talked with your dad about that, and nobody, he didn't even know it. I was like, it was unbelievable. There was hundreds of thousands of people on the side of there. I drove all the way from California. I was jumping from truck to truck. I went for, with them for like two weeks, right? And so I was listening wow. to the truckers talk, hundreds of thousands of people, Canadian flags everywhere. They were being Americans flying Canadian flags. I said, we should have taken the lead. And they're like, well, Canadians took it. So we're flying their flags right beside ours, right? And I said, wow. go Canada. And they're saying that here. A lot of the farmers here too are, are, are I don't think Canadians even know this. The Canadians know that the effect that the, 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 your truckers had was actually important, was very important. It looks like the thing just died out in Canada, but it didn't. It yeah. spread, you know? And so it, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's out here and it's growing still. And um, that here's, here's the thing. In, in the Netherlands, now they're flying the flags upside down, inverted, right? That's what we do in the United mm. States when you're under duress, right? You fly the flag upside down. So here, you know, their flag is red, white, and blue three stripes so they just invert it blue white and red so you know uh, about maybe 10 days ago the government said hey these are representing a danger flying over the bridges and, and the danger is people take a photo of it with their phone and put it on instagram and, and and it spreads right and so the government started taking these things down and that sort of thing and people you know other people like started putting more of them up, right so i mean the bottom line is the demonization of the farmers it's happened over and over and over around the world. Authoritarian Mao did it with in China. There's a great book on this called Mao's Great Famine. It's a great book. There's another book with Stalin doing it in Ukraine, 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 which is called a Red Famine, uh, and it goes into detail about the demonization of the farmers. And so when I hear when I was getting ready to do the interview with your father and the makeup ladies doing the makeup, I'm like. What do you think about the farmers? You know, and she's like, oh, you know, she she liked the farmers. Everybody here knows farmers, uh, but she's like, wow, you know, they're saying some bad things about them on the news. And I said, oh, it's the normal demonization process. And um, and she went on about it. And and so I talked after the interview yesterday. We sat down and had dinner together, numerous of us, and we talked about things for a while. And so it's it's the sort of thing that I see all over the world. Every I spent a year again in the in the war out in. Uh, in uh, in Nepal with the Maoists, right? I've walked up the Mount Everest in the in the meantime, just to the bottom, and you know, I was walking walking all over that. I've walked all over those mountains, man. That's some serious mountains. And uh, and I was out with the Maoists all the time and asking them what's up. And all of, I would hire guides to carry my books. You know, now I got this thing. I carry like a thousand books on it, right? But back then, I had a big Pelican case. I had to rent a horse at one point to carry my Pelican case filled with books. So I'd have like candles reading books, and you know, but these Maoists are like, you know, they would, they could never persuade me to be a Maoist. They, they would never hurt me because I would just be like, ah, that Maoist stuff is nonsense, you know, but they would, if I were Nepalese, they would have killed me for sure. But they would just be like, ah, you know, whatever. Come on, let's walk, you know, so, but you know, it, wow. it, so the, the, but the Maoists were trying to get everybody to divide and conquer, get everybody to split up. You can't get people to cooperate. You go over to Afghanistan where I spent two years. All the different ethnic groups, they just naturally are fractious. They, they can't get it together. You always have to have an outside force to come together. I say force. Let's say influence or, or spackle, let's say, that comes and gets, or gets group like the Nepalese. It's never going to be a really wealthy country because they always fight each other. You know, it's always like this group fights that group. So if you want to take the country over, you just exacerbate those fights. It's the same in, in Afghanistan. It was the same in India until the British came, right? So, you know, I spent almost a year in India as well. The Indians, they'll have a love-hate with the British. They're like, well, you know, the British did this, that, and the other. It was very bad. But the, the Indians will give credit where credit's due. They're like, but, you know, they did teach, they did give us a common language, uh, helped us with the railways and these sorts of things. And now India is, you know, is, is really made some really great, they're really coming along. But all these disparate groups fighting each other, this is, this is unconventional warfare 101, divide and conquer. And that's what WEF, World Economic Forum, or as they call it in Netherlands, WEF, that's their number one, the substrate of their war is divide and conquer. 
before you know it, they'll have Canada and the United States wanting to go to war with each other or something. You know, they'll figure out how to do that somehow, right? This episode is sponsored by Better Fed Beef, a direct-to-consumer company based in the American Midwest that produces a highly consistent beef product called Certified Anya Beef. These beauties. Look at this marbling. This stuff is great. Certified Anya Beef comes from cattle that are USD. A, inspected, antibiotic, and illness-free, born and raised within the U.S., no immigrant cows, and that meet the approved marbling measurements, just to name a few of their criteria. BetterFed controls every aspect of raising their cattle with diets designed by PhD ruminant nutritionists to optimize for excellent beef quality health. These guys are incredible. Um, I've bought from other companies, and I have to say... This is my favorite so far. You can see the marbling is insane. And I should know, I eat a lot of beef. These guys are really good. You should check them out. It gets delivered right to your door, flash frozen. They're raised in the Midwest. The cows are raised in the Midwest by 17 farming families. Their motto is real beef from real families. If you want to know more about them, you can check them out on the beef producers page of their website. They also pr practice whole animal butchery, so as much of the animal is used as possible. Their selections range from tomahawk and sirloin steaks to their backyard barbecue box, ribs, liver, heart, much more. Head over to the website at betterfedbeef.com and use promo code MP to get a whopping 20% off your first order today. That's code MP at betterfedbeef.com to try these guys. This is what I'm eating. They're good. Hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. So what can, uh, say somebody watching this is concerned about famine. Is there anything that the average person can do to either prepare or fight back? Yeah, many things. One is, at this point, now, in January of 2020, when I first started warning about it, we could have still averted it. At this point, there's too much inertia. We're clearly going to have global famines. I don't actually, and I'm a very positive thinking type of a man, you know, I just don't see a way out of this at this point. So now it's down to mitigation, right? Um, even though it hasn't really started in earnest yet, it's all about conditions. Again, amateurs always talk sparks. It's about conditions. The conditions are set for huge global famines. One is it depends on your conditions, right? Uh, what, how you should prepare. Um, if you live on Key West, so, you've got one set of issues and one set of, you know, it's warm. You don't have to worry about freezing to death. You're also not going to have a big farm, right? You know, I mean, you're not going to grow anything down there. Um, you're going to be short on food. Let's say if you live in any of the island nations, if you live in Japan, which ex imports about 70% of the food or so, right? Or if you live in Hawaii, imports about 90% of the food, you're going to be short. You're, and, you, you, you know, you're going to be uh, bidding against the world on the price of that food. Right. Uh, like, for instance, if I were in Hawaii, I mean, if I were if I were, you know, uh, some rich guy that lived on one little island off from the south there, you know, I would look at it differently than living in Honolulu. I would be thinking about going somewhere else. But if you live up in northern Canada or I've been up the yellow knife, you know, and that sort of thing, I'd be looking at it very differently. So first look at your own circumstances. Where do you live? Uh, what are your economic conditions? What are your capabilities? Uh, uh, stocking up can can be good for short-term sorts of things. That's what I've done as a work correspondent. I've basically hidden acorns all over the place. So if I get to one of my acorns, I'm good to go. As a work correspondent, I can't just stop and grow a bunch of food. So that my set of problems, so I look at my problems. What are my problems as a work correspondent? My, my, my weaknesses are I'm traveling all the time. So I can't just stop and build a compound, you know? And, uh, mm -hmm. and not that that would be necessarily the best way to go anyway. And my strengths are I do travel around all the time. And so and, and I'm very knowledgeable about different circumstances around the world and the United States. And so I've basically, implant, you know, put little acorns of food. If I can get the one of them, I can, you know, be there for a long period of time and, and be quite healthy and that sort of thing. Uh, but other people, if you live in New York City, where are you going to get your food from? Uh, if your electricity goes out, if you're and, and, and the, the thing is, is famines tend to cause uh, a general, a lot of people say United States can't go into famine. And to that, I would say you haven't studied much yet. You know, 
the United States absolutely can go into famine. And at this point, or parts of it certainly could. And at this point, I would say probably greater than 50% chance at this point that parts of the United States will go into famine between somewhere, I don't know, 2023, 2024, 2025. It's all about conditions, right? And right now we're living off the food that we've already produced, right? And, uh, and our production is diminishing uh, like it's going off the cliff, right? So what would you do? Look at your own circumstances. What are your own capabilities? How much uh, resources do you have? Uh, and, um, and one of the most th things that's most important is as individuals, we're all quite weak, right? Uh, one of my principal strengths is I know a lot of highly capable people. So I've been working on my network, right? And that's what everybody should work on is their network, right? Your network of people, because as individuals, we're all quite weak. But as teams, we can be in tribes, you might say, we can be strong or even powerful, right? And so work on your human network. Like for instance, one uh, man that I, he's a veteran down in South Texas, I met with him quite a bit. He came down to see me in Mexico actually. And we talked about that through, through his, he's like, I'm gonna take care of my community. He's taking charge of this little town in Texas. So he's like, so I've been taking inventory of who can do what? He's like, there's this one old lady, she's really worried. She's like, I, I don't have any money and all this. He's like, well, let's list down what are your skills. And she's like, well, you know, I can do this. I know how to sew. And she knows how to can food was one. He's like, can food. I need that. Okay. You're going to be our official food canner because that's going to be really important. <laughs> and so you got a job, you know, make yourself useful because once you're, once you're like, one of the things I'm very useful for is accurate information, global recon. And, you know, giving you information that's actually actionable, right? That, that makes me quite useful. And so I'll be welcome in any trap because I, I can be eyes and ears, right? Uh, uh, that lady, she can can food. I need to eat, you know? <laughs> and so uh, so we have to work as a team, and, right? We have to work. Um, the doctor can do doctor stuff. You know, the, the, you know, that's how you have to. Everybody has more skills than they even imagine, right? You like there's more skills in your head than you can even think about right now. You know what I mean? Because you, you, you're probably not normally thinking about them because you're normally focused on uh, doing other things like doing your, your, your very important podcast and these sorts of things. But let's say, you know, our communications do go down and you can't do podcasts anymore for some period of time. Well, you need to focus on other stuff. And uh, so you'll have to, you know, dig into your repertoire and like make yourself useful. And one of those things that you're obviously good at is talking with people and uh because i've watched quite a few of your podcasts you, you know i talk with people you're a good listener i can see you let me ramble on <laughs> and you know and then and that's like and uh and uh and um and organize organize you know organizers are incredibly important you know like that man in south texas he's like taking an inventory of his old town he started with his church what are their skills? He's like, I'm making a spreadsheet. Who do I? He's getting people with radios because so, he, you know, assuming phones may not work or power goes down, radio up, right? And, uh, you know, getting all the, and, you know, we'll get through this. It's not like the end of the world. Our, everybody listening to this has, our family have been through all sorts of hell. Our generations have been through so many things. And, uh, and we're here. Right. So we're, we're, we're natural survivors, especially people that are thinking ahead, not being afraid. I'm a workhorse. Some people say, you know, if, since January uh, 2020, uh, when I started warning about famine, uh, people, some people said, wow, you've done so much war, but you're afraid now. I'm like, I'm not afraid. I'm just warning you. Uh, I'm a war correspondent. I've been in more mm -hmm. firefights than you've seen in most movies, right? It's like, I, I don't like them and they're not fun, but at the same time, I continue to go back to them, right? So, I mean, I, I'm going to be fine. I know I'm going to be fine. And you're going to be fine if you think ahead and you work on your networks and you think about your resilience. Make sure you stockpile the things that you need now that you won't be able to get later. Uh, like uh, canning supplies, you know, the types of salts that you need, the types of vinegar, the you know, jars and a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and then we'll get through it. And then when it's over, we'll be telling uh, children, our children someday, like how bad it was. And they'll think you're exaggerating. And, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they'll be like, it couldn't have been that bad. You'll be like, yeah, well, I was eating the horse's saddle. I had to boil it. You know? <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, oh my like goodness. Okay. Uh, if people want to follow you online or want to go anywhere for more information about this, do you have recommendations for them? Uh, I go on Locals every day, Locals.com. And I have a website as well, um, uh, MichaelYon.com. My last name is Y-O-N, Yankee Oscar November. And, um, and I do a lot of interviews I have for years. And uh, But Locals.com is where I uh, publish every day. And on Locals, I try to actually answer uh, questions. Actually, on my own website, I don't normally answer questions, but I'll do it on Locals because it's easier for me. Uh, it doesn't. I can quickly get to them. Um, I, obviously, I can't answer everything. I, I try, but you know, I work basically, and then sleep, and then work. <laughs> yeah, like you, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, similar, but not not quite, not exactly the same. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming on. That was really interesting. I might have to have you back on just to talk about the entire picture because I know this was a little bit more focused on famine, but that was that was very interesting. So thank you for that. Anytime. You know how to reach me. Nick Ottens, welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, so before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Uh, so currently I'm a journalist based in the Netherlands. Uh, before I reported from uh, Spain, I lived in Barcelona for a few years. And in the past, I've worked for a number of political risk consultancies and an American nonprofit. And at the nonprofit, I also worked on uh, food and agriculture issues. And now, as a journalist, I write mostly about Dutch, uh, Spanish, and French politics. And food and agriculture is still one of my interests. Okay, great. Um, let's let's get started then. Uh, what is going on in the Netherlands in regards to the farmers' protest? Can you just give a brief overview about what that's about? So the protest started about four weeks ago, and the government put out a plan for reducing emissions of nitrogen. Uh, the plan is to cut emissions in half by 2030. And since farms are the main uh, source of nitrogen emissions, they produce about 40% of overall emissions, they will have to reduce their emissions by 40%. Uh, most of the farmers uh, who are protesting are livestock farmers because almost all of the nitrogen that's, pollu uh, that's produced in farming is ammonia pollution, which only comes from livestock farms. There are about 30,000 of them in the country. Under the government's plans, about 11,000, so one in three, would need to quit altogether. And another 17,000, which is almost the remainder, would need to downsize. Hmm. Okay, um, what's the protest trying to achieve? Well, so they're, they're worried about the cuts, obviously, and opposed yeah. to them. So many uh, dairy farmers, many pig farmers, they're, they're struggling to break even most years because the price of milk and the price of meat is more or less at break-even price. So they're saying if you're going to ask us to, to remove 10% or 20% of our animals, that means we'll be bankrupt. So for them, reductions within the current model are not really an option. And obviously the farmers who would quit are opposed to that because they want to continue farming. Uh, how does the public uh, in the Netherlands feel about the protests and what's going on? So there's, uh, there's a lot of sympathy with the farmers. If you look at the polls, about 70% of people, they understand why farmers are upset. About 40% of people support the protests themselves that have taken place. So they have blocked motorways and food distribution centers with tractors. And then another 35% are opposed to the protest and the people in the middle are unsure. So mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that the country is kind of split down the middle in terms of whether to support the protests. But when it comes to supporting the farmers, the clear majority are sympathetic and they understand why farmers are upset. Um, is, is it true that the Netherlands is the second largest food exporter in the world? Yes, so after the United States, we're the second exporter of uh, agricultural products, although it's worth knowing that uh, about 9% of those exports are flowers and bulbs, so that's not food. And then another 27 or 29% are re-exports. So those are products, for example, imported from North America or from South America, which are imported through the Netherlands, the port of Rotterdam, and then go on to the rest of Europe. So for the remainder, that's mostly uh, food products. Uh, but in order to export that much, we also have to import a lot. So we're the, um, the, the largest exporter of meat in Europe, 
and the fifth largest exporter of dairy in the world. Most of those exports mm. go to Germany, to France, to Belgium and the UK, so the countries surrounding the Netherlands. But we don't, we're not a big country. We don't have a lot of land to grow cereals and soy to feed the animals. So that is mostly imported from North America and from South America, fed to the animals here. And then the products, the dairy and the meat is exported again to our neighboring countries. Do you think it's reasonable to expect the Netherlands to reduce their emissions given the fact that they're the second largest exporter? Um, well, it's not really much of a choice because the government is sort of under a legal obligation to. So these ammonia emissions have been in excess of the legal limit for 30 years. Ever since these regulations were introduced, they are European regulations for the protection ah, for of the conservation years. areas. The rules were introduced in the 1990s and we have never mm -hmm. met them. So it's not really a choice. It's The question is how, how are we going to do it? So the reason it's such a concern is because when there's too much ammonia pollution uh, in the environment around farms, it actually helps certain plant species grow, but it means that other plants wither and they die. And those are sources of, of, of nutrition for insects. If those insect species disappear, about 70% of the insect population of the Netherlands has disappeared in the last 30 years. That means that a source of food for birds disappears. So we see entire ecosystems collapse in the country. So it's not really a question of whether to reduce emissions, but how and by how much. To go back to your question, of course, that will affect exports. It means that if we want to feed our own people first and we reduce farming, it means that we can export less or at least less dairy and less meat products, less milk, less eggs. The other farming, the other types of farming, the growing of crops, uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, paprika, that's not affected. And those are major export products as well and actually more profitable export products. The margin on dairy and meat is pretty low. So it's a question, is it worth it to reduce emissions? Given that we're not making that much money and we're getting all of the, all of the pollution, which is harmful to our animals, to our environment, I think the, well, at least the government decided it is. Um, so with these new regulations, do you know how much less meat and dairy will be exported? What percentage perhaps? No, that's a bit hard to say. So the question now is if we just make a 30% reduction in, in livestock farming, which you would need to do in order to achieve a 40% reduction in emissions, you would say, well, there's one third less dairy, one third less meat, right? But that's not necessarily the case. You, there are various other options. You could either move further into the direction of more intensive animal farming, so keeping a higher number of animals on the same, uh, on the same space at lower cost, but that tends to increase emissions. The alternative is switching in more in the direction of organic farming, so having fewer animals on more land, but then of course the, the decrease in production will be even steeper because they will simply have fewer animals, they will live longer, they will live healthier, they'll be happier, but you'll have less meat, you'll have less dairy. Do you see any parallels or potential parallels between what's happening in the Netherlands and what Sri Lanka tried to implement with their organic farming? Yeah, well, from what I know, it seems that they try to move very fast and essentially abolish uh, factory farming within a few years. That's not a reasonable goal to set on Dutch farmers. For decades, they have been pushed into this sort of system by the banks and by the, the companies that buy their products and by the consumers who want cheap food, not just in the Netherlands, but also in Germany, France, Belgium, to produce higher and higher volumes of meat and dairy and eggs at a lower and lower price. So the whole farm system has been pushing them in that direction and designed around that model of intensive animal farming. So you can't simply get rid of that in a few years. It needs to be a transition uh, and the government needs to help, which it is. It's making uh, 32 billion euros available, which is about 4% of Dutch GDP over the next eight years to help farmers either um, to, to, to downsize or to expropriate, to buy out those farmers who cannot continue or to relocate them. Because there might also be farmers who are now situated right next to a conservation area where their emissions are too high. But if another farmer quits somewhere else in the country, they might move. They just need some financial help to do so and continue farming there. 
So there's a lot of money. There is time. There's eight years to meet this goal to get there. It still won't be easy, but I don't expect a Sri Lanka-like scenario because I don't. I think that the Dutch government is a little wiser than that. I hope. Um, do you think are are people concerned about the unintended consequences for people who depend on these food exports? Well, sure. Um, f- first of all, there are the consumers in other countries who depend on them. Mm-hmm. Although I wouldn't expect people in Germany and in Belgium to starve if we produce less meat. But we also export all over the world. So it's a fair concern. And there is a whole industry that is dependent on the farmers. So you have the companies that produce the animal feed, which they sell to the farmers. There are the logistical companies which transport products. There is the meat and dairy processing industry. There is the supermarkets. All of those that employs tens of, uh, tens of thousands of people in the country. So there's a lot of people whose livelihoods depend on this. And there will be people who will, will lose their jobs, who will lose their business as a result. Uh, do you think this has anything to do with kind of the push for more plant-based that's been going around, I think, around the world? Or is this purely climate? It's Yeah, it's kind of the other way around. This It's not so much that the the move towards a more plant-based diet is the reason for doing this. It's more that we need to do this because of the the ammonia emissions, which are local, uh, destructive to our nature. And in order to be able to do that, we should switch to a more plant-based diet because we'll we'll just won't be able to produce the volumes of dairy and meat that we have for the last 20, 30 years. Okay, let me see what else I have here. Okay, so you talked a little bit about the local benefit of reducing nitrogen emissions. Um, What happens if the emissions aren't reduced? So then you see a continuation of what we've been seeing. Now, to be fair, the farmers have reduced uh, nitrogen emissions by a lot in the last 30 years, by about 65%. So that has been uh, a large uh, improvement to the conservation areas, to the local nature, to the uh, quality of our air, to the quality of groundwater, but it hasn't been enough to arrest this decline uh, in the loss of biodiversity. So you see that insect populations are shrinking. You see that certain bird species, which were very common in the Netherlands 20, 30, 40 years ago, have become rare. So we need to reduce further in order to uh, to, to give these conservation areas a chance to recover. And if we don't, well, then we'll just have to accept that we failed and that we need to give up these conservation areas. Um, If farms begin to close in fairly large numbers, um, will the remaining farmers be able to make up the difference in uh, food production or will the total output be less? Well, that's an interesting question. So if you look at, as in I'm not sure, but I hope they will be. If you look at just the reductions, and you would assume that everybody else continues to farm as they do now, then the answer would be no. However, there are many innovations which could help. So there are innovations in growing crops, in horticulture, in, in, uh, uh, in growing uh, in greenhouses, where you'll be able to increase productions. There is innovation in cultivated meat, or what people might call lab-grown meat. There are two Dutch companies which are quite large, and one of them just this week announced that they have been able to lab-grow the first pork sausage. In order to do that, they will still need animal tissue. So they need to work with farmers to get animal cells, which they then take to their lab, to their facilities to grow meat. But that could be a new model for farmers and for the Dutch food industry to, at the very least, maintain the level of meat production that we have now and potentially grow it because there's huge growth potential in these companies. They only need a little bit of animal material in order to, I don't know, grow 40 stakes. So we Do might you... actually, if we invest in that, then at the end of the, of the day in 2030, our meat production might actually be higher with fewer farmers and fewer farm animals. Do you know much about uh, the lab grown meat? Like when they grow meat, do they grow a muscle tissue? Do you know how that works? Like, is that what the end product is? Yeah, I'm not, I haven't actually seen it in the flesh. But the way that that's been described to me is they take animal cells and under certain, in a certain growth medium, it is grown. And at the end of the process, you have a piece of meat which looks and tastes and smells exactly like a real piece of meat would. 
And in a sense, you might argue it is real meat because it starts with an animal, uh, animal tissue, animal cells. So the Dutch government is subsidizing uh, for 60 million euros research and education into this field. There are two large Dutch companies which are active globally. So I, I have high hopes that this could be a, not a complete replacement, but a, an important addition to the animal farming that we do and also help those animal farmers who remain to actually make more money than they do now. Because right now, most animal farmers, they don't make a lot of profit. The price of meat, supermarkets always want the lowest price. Mm -hmm. Consumers aren't willing to pay that much more. And now the government is saying, get rid of 20% of your cows or 20% of your pigs. This could be a huge help to them if they are able to sell animal tissue to cultivated meat companies at a good price to combine those ty two types of farming to, on the one hand, provide animal cells to cultivated meat companies, and on the other hand, sell the meat of their own animals as a sort of a luxury product after they've had a full and normal life. So these laws, um, you said they're being implemented by the government, but they have been around a while and it's, it's more being implemented from the European Union? They're, well, the thing is, the European Union hasn't implemented them at all. So they have been telling us for 30 years, every year, they've been writing a letter to the Dutch government saying, you're not meeting the rules, you're not meeting the rules, but they haven't taken any action. It's only the, uh, since the Dutch uh, Supreme Court ruled three years ago that the Dutch government was not doing enough, that it forced the Dutch government into action to come up with a plan. And that plan is here now. Uh, it's a European rule, but Europe doesn't have the capability to enforce it and they haven't enforced it. It's the Dutch government that is now finally choosing to enforce it. Okay. And I think I asked this before, but do you think it's reasonable to put such a large exporter of meat under the same emission laws as other like countries in Europe? That, well, yeah, that's what some of the farmers and some of the meat industry are arguing, mm -hmm. saying we have to follow the same strict regulations, but we produce so much more and we have so much less space. Is it really fair? Well, we should have argued that 30 years ago when we were making the rules. Like we made this agreement and we haven't kept our word to our other European partners for 30 years. So now if we go back to Brussels and argue for leniency, then the European Commission will say no. Like we haven't, we haven't forced you to take action, but we're also not going to make the rules uh, le looser now. I think another point which is sort of related to this is the question, is it fair to put it all on the farmers? And there I think the answer is no. Because it's not just the farmers, there's a whole industry around it. So if you look at just agriculture per se, that's about 1.4% of the Dutch economy. But if you add up all of the companies that are working around farmers, so the meat processing industry, the dairy processing industry, supermarkets, slaughterhouses, animal feed company, the companies that build the technology, that's 6.4% of the economy, so that's a large sector. And the banks who give the loans to the farmers, the big companies are making the most money. They have the financial buffers to invest in a transition to a form of agriculture that is less polluting and more animal friendly. It's unreasonable to expect the farmers to do this all by themselves. That's for sure. Okay, let's see. What else do I have to ask about this? Do you think anything's going to come of the protests? How long have they been going on? So for four weeks, uh, you see that they're becoming a bit less intense than when they started. So in the beginning, there were demonstrations outside Parliament, outside the home of the, the Minister of Nature Policy. There were death threats, there were like, fires, there were riots. Now it's mostly been peaceful protests, but they do continue. Uh, the government has appointed a mediator in an attempt to, uh, to meet with representatives of farmers to try to work out a solution. The government has set national goals, but the provincial governments, or sort of the state governments, they will have to implement uh, the policy at a local level and translate those goals into a local policy. So deciding on a case-by-case -case basis which farms need to go, which farms need to stay, which farms need to downsize. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of room for flexibility over the next few years to try to save as many farms as possible. But the government has been very clear that we are not going to reduce the goal of 
cutting emissions in half by 2030. That's sort of set. And then how to achieve it, there is room for, for flexibility. Um, and you talked about it a little bit, but can you describe again um, how it would be possible to achieve this? Like what flexibility is there other than shutting down some of these farms? Yeah, so there are actually quite a lot of options. Um, so the, the possibility of relocating, imagine you're a farmer, you're situated right next to a conservation area. If you move two kilometers away, that could already make a big impact on the emissions in that conservation area because the emissions are pretty local. There is technology. So there are machines which can capture the ammonia emissions from the stables and recycle it either into fertilizer or into a biogas. That's expensive though, but the technology exists. So that could be a solution for quite a number of farms. There is cheaper technology to separate uh, dung and urine so that less ammonia is produced from the manure of animals in the first place. That also requires investments in the stables, but there are many farmers who have already made those investments in, in the last like 10 years, and they have seen reductions. All of those things could add up. Uh, farms that are currently 100% uh, livestock farmers, they could also say, if they wanted to reduce by say 50% and grow crops in addition to livestock farming, crops which might serve as animal feed. They would probably need financial help to make it work, but that could also, that would significantly uh, reduce emissions and it would also improve the welfare of the animals and the health of the animals. Because currently we give them a lot of sort of synthetic food because natural food is more expensive. Uh, biological or, or organic farming is still pretty small as a share of overall farming, it's like 5%. But it is growing, and that too is something that can help because you have lower emissions uh, from organic farming. And the EU goal is to achieve 25% organic farming in 2030. I kind of doubt we'll make that since we're coming from 5% to grow to 25%. But growing towards that goal, and there are many farmers who want to, uh, would help. But again, that need, that their products will be more expensive, so they will need financial help to make that work. Okay, so you said that 5 to 25% for organic farming, which isn't z like basically 0 to 100, which is what happened in Sri Lanka. Well, that, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it is a lot. It's a, it needs to uh, increase by a lot in order to meet the EU target. The interesting thing is a majority of farmers want to switch to organic farming mm -hmm. because it's they will require less fertilizer, less animal feed. Uh, they will use uh, less pesticides, less antibiotics for animals because they're healthier. And I think for a farmer, it's just more enjoyable to have fewer animals so that you can actually take more individual care of them. But it is expensive. And right now, uh, it doesn't look like a majority of consumers are willing to pay that premium. So I think what needs to happen is in that chain in between farmer and consumer, all of those companies which are taking out a little bit of the profit until the product reaches the consumer, they all need to chip in. So the meat processing, the dairy processing companies, the, uh, the supermarkets, the logistics companies, the, the wholesalers, they all need to accept a lower profit margin on organic product so that by the time it reaches the store, the price difference between organic farming and the products that come out of the factory farming is reduced. I think that's the way to make it work. Is the government, so you said the government is offering money to farmers. How is that getting into farmers' hands? Uh, so that's uh, like sort of a two-step level because the central government is giving money to the provincial governments and then they will decide which farms can stay and which need to go and the ones that need to go will receive compensation based on the value of their land. So it's just the value of their land at the time, and that's the amount of money they get? Uh, that also still needs to be worked out because farmers are arguing, well, that's fine, but I have 2 billion euros in debt with a bank. Oof. So you can pay me for my, for my land, but I need to pay off that loan. And then the government is saying, well, we don't want all of that money to eventually end up with the bank, <laughs> which has been making all these loans. So that's another thing that needs to be... Um, worked out in more detail over the next few months to make sure that farmers actually get to keep that compensation. Mm. It probably oh. won't be 100% of 
for uh, all farmers, especially if they have uh, high depths and little land. But it needs to be worked out in a way that is fair, obviously. So, so part of the protests, I suppose, are people who are concerned about bankruptcy. Yes, absolutely. And they're, they're afraid of being left with, um, with huge debts with the bank. The same bank that has been encouraging them to invest in larger stables in technology. So their debts have been growing in order to meet previous regulations for emissions, for animal welfare. So you can imagine that the average farmer sort of feels uh, sort of exhausted by this because they've been trying and they have been doing their best to meet so many rules and regulations over the last 20, 30 years. Now there's something else and it could result in them losing their farm. So it, I understand the, the frustration, but something also needs to be done because we're just not meeting our obligations and we are not, we are not taking good care of our natural environment. Um, how do you feel about kind of the, I don't know whether or not it's propaganda or misinformation, but other information that's been going out online regarding the farmers' protests? I know there's been a, quite a bit in the U.S. Um, kind of equating the farmers with, well, the Canadian truckers, for example, or people fighting for, for freedom. Um, how much of that is true? Well, I think that there is a commonality where you see um, sort of this divide in many Western countries between the big city and the countryside. And people in more rural areas feel that the people in charge, people in the government, they don't understand our way of life. They are making these decisions over our heads. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a commonality. Although the Netherlands is such a small country that the difference between city and countryside, I mean, if I take a train from Amsterdam in an hour, I reach my parents' home, they live in the middle of the countryside. If I take a, a, a train the other way in an hour, I'm in Belgium. So the difference between city and countryside is much smaller here than in the US and Canada or even Spain or France. But it, it does exist. Like there is a different, um, a, a difference, a different way of life. And I, it doesn't help when uh, politicians who have been raised in the city, who live in the big city, who don't really know the countryside well, need to make these decisions. And the farmers, uh, the organizations which are meant to represent them, um, they are left in negotiations. So you get a, a clash where the two sides aren't talking with each other anymore. And maybe that has something in common too, like this sense of alienation, of not really understanding each other, like talking at a different level. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that there, there is a commonality with, with what's going on in other, in other democracies. Uh, you've, I think you've mentioned this already too, but what percentage of the um, meat industry or the dairy industry actually is exported versus just feeding people in the Netherlands? I, 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 I don't remember exactly. I thought it was about 40%. Okay, so quite a big chunk of yeah, it goes to other countries. Yes, for sure. And like, don't pin me down on the number. But yeah, yeah. It, but a lot, for sure. And if, if as I mentioned, these, these reductions go through, you would see a significant decrease in Dutch exports of dairy and meat. Okay. And people aren't worried about this causing food shortages. Or is that part of the concern? I No, because most of these products, they're exported to Germany, to France, to the UK, and to Belgium. So these are not countries that are going to starve just because we're able to sell them less yogurt and less, less, less sausages. Now, the concern, I think, is more uh, with the, the livelihood of farmers and that some farms uh, will just relocate to these countries, go to Germany, go to Belgium, set up farms there. Mm -hmm. And then you're also... Uh, relocating the emissions. So then Germany will have the same problem in a few years if they need to produce more of their own meat. Some of them will be Dutch farmers coming to Germany. And then their emissions of ammonia will go up. And then we have solved our problem, but we have created a whole new problem for the Germans, for example. Are there other countries in Europe that produce far under the, the amount of, I guess, ammonia you're allowed to produce? Well, yes, because the it's not so much a total amount, although if you look at the total, the Netherlands has the highest emissions of ammonia per hectare 
in the EU. But it's more the uh, how much buffer do you have around it so that the, 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 uh, the conservation areas, nature, trees, the water, the grounds can absorb the amount of ammonia. So we pollute so much ammonia in such a small country that it's just too much for the plants, for, our, for the quality of our soil to handle it. This is why they don't have this problem in France or in Germany or in Spain, because they have a farm industry that is sort of the same size as ours, but much more land. So the emissions spread out. Hmm. Okay, that all makes sense. Let me see, do I have any other questions here? I think that, I think that pretty much covered it. Is there anything else you want to mention about what's going on? Um, well, you might, there's the political implications, obviously, for the government. So the, we have a, a coalition government of center-left and center-right parties. So they're pretty much in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, so, they're in an impossible situation. Because on the one hand, they need the support of left-wing parties because they don't have a majority, uh, who want to go further or who want to go fast. On the other hand, the, the ruling Christian Democrats and the ruling Liberal Party, and Liberal is a center-right party here, they have a lot of supporters okay. in the countryside. So they feel resistance from their own voters, from their own provincial deputies, saying this is too much for us, this is going to cost us votes in the next election. But if they make concessions, then the left-wing parties, whom they also need, will withdraw their support or force the government to resign. So it's sort of an impossible situation for the parties in the middle. Whatever they do, they will be unpopular. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, um, what do you think about the kind, uh, I don't know exactly what to call it, but the idea going around that this is just the government stealing land under the guise of ammonia reduction? No, that's, that's like going one step too far. The government does need land to build houses because we also have a huge housing shortage in the country, about 300,000. Uh, but you don't need that much land to build houses. Like half of the Netherlands is agricultural land. If you just take one percentage of that, you would have enough land to build 300,000 homes. The problems is with the permitting. So the court case that happened three years ago where the Dutch Supreme Court said uh, that the government is not doing enough to reduce ammonia emissions or nitrogen emissions, of which ammonia are part. That put on, on hold all of the construction permits, because when you build a road or a house or whatever, you also release a little bit of nitrogen. And the judges said, you are already releasing too much nitrogen, you can't emit more. So in the last three years, we have barely been able to build homes. So we need to solve wow. this problem in order to start this permitting process again so we can build roads, so we can build houses, so, we, so companies can expand. So in that sense, there is a link between the farm crisis and the housing crisis. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, I think that answers all the questions I had. Um, if people want to read more about this, is there anywhere they can go online? Well, they should go to my website. They can go to AtlanticSentinel.com. That's my blog. And there has been some coverage in the international press uh, about this as well, but not that much, surprisingly, because I think it actually has implications globally. Like to me, we have sort of reached the limits of factory farming in the Netherlands. So I think that's a warning to other countries which are on that same trajectory, that mm -hmm. if you don't do anything, you'll be in the same situation we are in 10 or 20 years from now. So I mm -hmm. hope there will be more interest and I'm sure your show will help to generate more interest in the topic. Hopefully, yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming on. I'll link your blog uh, in the description if anybody's interested in checking it out. Uh, but thank you again. Thank you so much.